Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and today we're talking about Volta Triple as it pertains to power supplies, overclocking, and component longevity. This is something we've already published on the website. It was written by Michael Kearns, one of our writers, and that talks about what Volta Triple is and how it impacts those two factors. But we're going to dive into it a little bit more here for the YouTube audience. So first of all, what is Volta Triple? Volta Triple is the fluctuation of the voltage supply down each of your three main lines of power, your rails. So your 12 volt, your 5 volt, and your 3.3 volt are not perfectly 12, 5, and 3.3 volts if you read them out with an oscilloscope. In fact, the voltage of each of these different lines of power, we'll talk specifically about 12 volt because it goes to the GPU, the CPU, things like that. The power supplied, the voltage supplied down the 12 volt line is not going to be perfectly 12.0 volts. If you read it out with an accurate instrument like an oscilloscope or an oscope, you'll see that it might fluctuate between, for example, 12.1, 12.14, it might drop down, and this is called voltage ripple. So this is the amount of fluctuation in the waveform peak to peak between the voltage levels as the voltage is continuously supplied to whatever it's going to. And there is an ATX specification for power supplies. This is the spec to which all power supplies sold in the consumer market must abide. There is a much stricter server spec that is really not something you'll encounter in general in the consumer market. So let's look at the ATX spec. The specification for ATX power supplies for voltage ripple is that they must be less than 120 millivolts. So you should see a fluctuation no greater than 120 millivolts down any of your 12 volt rails. The specification for 3.3 and 5 volt is 50 millivolts, so there should be no greater than 50 millivolts of fluctuation in those instances. But some higher end power supplies will target 60 millivolts of fluctuation, which is pretty darn good, and that's actually what Michael Kearns, myself included, we both kind of look for power supplies in that range when we're buying because we do a lot of enthusiast stuff like overclocking. You want to make sure you have a very consistent voltage supply when you're dealing with any kind of very volatile components, which is what happens in overclocking. So that's what voltage ripple is. It's the fluctuation of voltage down the supply. It's very normal. It's not something you can really have down to zero, especially in the consumer market. So you're always going to have some voltage ripple. It's just a matter of how much. And this impacts two main things, as I've mentioned, it impacts component longevity and it impacts the overclocking stability. So with component longevity, that is impacted because voltage ripple will increase the demand on the VRMs and the power supply itself to regulate the voltage supply. And it also increases the heat of capacitors. As capacitors heat up, they are more prone to popping, to failure, and just leakage or damage over time. So there is a an electro... Uh, electrical engineering rule that states that for every 10 degrees Celsius drop in thermals, the capacitor should be expected to double its lifespan if we're talking about a non-solid electrolytic capacitor, which is a fairly common type of capacitor. On the higher end components, you will see solid capacitors, slightly different rules apply, but that's the, the general idea. So less heat is very good for capacitors, helps them live longer, and a healthier power supply means healthier components receiving the power. So that's the, the heat issue, the component longevity issue. If you have more voltage ripple, you're putting your devices, the power supply especially, and the receiving devices, the VRM, all of that goes through more strain when trying to make the fine-tuned adjustments to keep your system running stably. And then on the overclocking side, we have a slightly different concern. So let's take an example. Say your GPU at a strictly hardware level, electrically, requires 1.212 volts. This is somewhat standard for some architectures. So this is not the voltage that your overclocking software says you are providing. This is the voltage that the GPU says it wants. It's on an electrical level, purely hardware level. Now let's step it back. So now we're looking at the software. If you start overclocking, and you need to supply more voltage, then you increase the voltage increment in your overclocking software. That much we know. The amount that it is incremented will depend on a lot of things. We're gonna forget about most of them for now, but the, the one we're talking about here is voltage ripple. So if the ripple is 50 millivolts, which is very reasonable, then you will have to, as a user, 
effectively add in an extra 50 millivolts of overhead of room for fluctuation in the supply of voltage to the GPU. Because what happens is if you dip down below what the GPU needs electrically because of voltage ripple or really because of anything, you'll exhibit instability and in, you'll see instability in the system. You'll see driver crashing, flickering, black screens, stuff like that. Stuff we've all discussed in our various articles on the website on gamersnexus.net. Kearns and I have both talked about this. So that's where the overclocking impact is. That's why you want a good power supply. You want something that can eat the extra load and supply some stability to your system. There's a lot more to power supply selection than this. So if you are curious about power supplies, how they work, what the other specs mean, what active PFC is and stuff like that, check the website. We have a specs dictionary. It is at the top in the menu and you'll find a PSU dictionary in there. We defined several of these. We're adding more definitions soon. And then the Voltage Ripple article is already live on the site. So that's the basics of Voltage Ripple, why it is important and how it can impact your system. We do, of course, recommend high quality power supplies, but it's not always possible. And for budget reasons, it's not always within budget. So it is not the end of the world if you can't afford a $100 power supply, but even when you're looking at the low end, you do want kind of a bottom line of how low you're willing to go and how low quality you are willing to accept. So do consider, am I overclocking? Am I planning to use the system for a very long time? And other factors like that, how much you're willing to spend, how much efficiency do you need? And that will all help in determining how much you should really budget toward a power supply. If you are doing extreme overclocks, definitely consider a higher end power supply because you need that stability. So that is all for this time. Check out our forthcoming Ask a GN video. We've been doing these lately. So there's a uh, power supply discussion on there actually where we talk about the wattage supply to components. So that's all for this time. Hit the Patreon link in the post roll of this video if you like our content and want to support us. We're up to nine backers now. So as I keep saying, starting small, but it's helping us with removing some of our dependency on the regular advertising of the industry. So that lets us keep doing some more uh, free of criticism from manufacturers content, which I know you all enjoy. I will see you all next time.